Hey, Mark Striegel here, and I recently was down at the M3 Rock Festival, the 10-year anniversary of the M3 Rock Festival, and we ran into the one and only Lon Friend, a guy I've been friends with for oh, quite a while. I think 2006 or 2007 is when I first met him, probably 2006 when his first book came out, Life on Planet Rock. He since went on to do a second book, which is called Sweet Demotion. He was a part of MTV's Headbangers Ball for a while, doing the Friend at Large segments. He worked at KNAC. He's written liner notes for albums by Motley Crue, Bon Jovi, Metallica, Dio, and many more. He was the music supervisor on a movie called Airheads with Steve Buscemi and Brendan Fraser. And he was also the vice president of a and for Arista Records from 1993 to 1998. And you know, pre-RIP, he actually wrote for some of Larry Flynn's other magazines such as Hustler and stuff. I think he worked for Larry Flynn for like 13 years or something. And of course, then there's all the writing he did for other magazines too, like of course, Hits, Rolling Stone, The Album Network, The Westwood One Radio Show, Pirate Radio Saturday Night, the resume on this guy is staggering, and what an honor to meet up with my friend, Lon Friend, and Chris Bush, who, big props to this guy, because he took the RIP brand name, which was basically sitting unattended, left for dead, and has kind of started to bring it back to life with an online present, bringing the merch back, and all sorts of great stuff. Chris, Emily, and I want our RIP t-shirts, so we, we, we'll trade you some Talking Metal t-shirts for RIP t-shirts. Cool, here we go. Without further ado, my interview with Lon Friend and Chris Bush at this year's M3 Festival. Hey, it's Mark Striegel, and I am here with Lon Friend, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And Mitch. the current owner of RIP, Chris Bush. The, tr the trademark owner. The trademark owner. He's bringing the swag back with a vengeance. Yeah. So, Chris, how did you end up with the RIP trademark? You got all these cool hats. Sure. Shirts that have the classic RIP logo. You're bringing it back. Right. A great Facebook page. Right. Is RIP being reborn, and how are you doing this? Yeah, well, I, I was a photojournalist and, and writer for a lot of different music publications, uh, including Billboard and Elmore and Music Monthly. And Lon and I became good friends over the years. And when we were doing research, I was trying to figure out what sort of platform would be best for launching um, you know, an online music magazine that talked about a lot of these bands that we all know and love. So the more research I did, I realized that Larry Flint had let the trademark lapse on, on RIP, and it was essentially sitting there open for anyone to essentially wow. grab. And I, and I talked to Lon, and we had a serious heart-to-heart, -heart, and I said, you know, I just don't think it would be right for just anyone to grab this thing. I think that, uh, you know, we should, we should take it, and we should do something, something respectful with it. And so um, went through the application process, and I guess the, the trademark I've had for probably five or six years now. And since then, it was sort of a, it's, it's just been sort of a, just a waterfall of different um, things that I've picked up along the way. Hit Parader, um, Starwood, uh, Madame Wong's, and Lemore's, and a lot of these things that yeah. I'm, I'm, I would really love to be able to resurrect and for people to kind of, you know, relive their experiences with these different at these different venues and with these different publications. But but RIP is the emphasis of what I wanted to do. And like you said, we've got a Facebook page, we've got an Instagram page, and we've kind of organically built, rebuilt the brand um, through social media. And right now we're trying to see where we can where we can take it from there. It should be, it's been fun. Lon, would you have ever imagined that these many years later there's still such a, a you know incredible interest in this magazine that, that you really branded and, and brought to all of us? It's, it's ironic that we sit here and have this conversation at the M3 Festival. Yeah. Because it is a conflagration of so many of the bands who found their, their sauce in the pages of our magazine. And yeah, it's, the last issue was published 22 years ago, and I left the magazine uh, 24, 25 years, 24 years ago. Right. And yet their day doesn't go by where I don't get a message or someone just says something to me. And usually a musician or a fan, I miss Rip. And I said, well, thank you. And I'm very right. humbled by it because we, we were really special. I, I just wanted 
the magazine to to be a voice of the of that decade and I didn't you know I said this in my first book I did not script the alignment of Guns N' Roses and Injustice for All and the Black Record and Aerosmith and all those things coming to me it was just building relationships and having the best writers and the best photographers and right. that was old school it's not that way anymore it's websites and social media and then then it was like you held this magazine in your hand I'll tell you just an anecdote that echoes this I'm in Nuremberg Germany in 2000 doing uh, knac.com content right at the beginning of streaming media and right about this in your second book yeah, right I know this I know this story second book. Yep. and I don't know if I said this anecdote but um, Slipknot's playing yep they get wind that I'm backstage and this guy comes to get me and he walks me in the dressing room and I only knew a bl tiny bit of Slipknot had just released their first record, right. but they had such a buzz that they got on the bill at the Rock and Park in Nuremberg, yeah. Germany, which is a huge annual festival that this year, the year I was there, Rage Against the Machine was headlining. Corn played, I think, Korn, that year, too. Corn, P.O.D. Methods uh, of Mayhem Methods was there. Of, very good, yeah. Mark. Yeah. I, re I read the yeah. books. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. And um, I walk in this in this trailer and this and this the dude goes, this is Lon Friend. And it's like three of them almost dropped to their knees. Yeah. They went rip magazine. Buck, man. And I think Corey, it was I think it was Corey that said, dude, we're from Iowa every month. All we had then was your magazine. That's why we're here. Something to paraphrase, like it was that important yeah. in, in, the, in uh, the teenagers that became the next generation of those heavy bands, that they, that they really cared about this magazine. Right. And I, that meant a lot to me, because I went, and then I ended up giving Corey my last pair of ripped sweatpants, speaking of swag. I had these ripped sweatpants that I, that from like 91. Yeah. And I saw Slipknot play a show in, um, Phoenix and it's like 109 degrees and I go dude if I give you these sweatpants he goes Lana put them on right now yeah. I don't care how hot it is hey, well they're yours and that was, that was yeah. Chris you got to bring back the ripped sweatpants <laughs> absolutely that's they're coming they're coming yeah. I'm inspired now you know and as a reader of, of the magazine you know before rip I had circus I had hip parade but there was always something that that seemed you know, no disrespect towards those magazines, but unsincere about them. And and what what you did with Rip, there we we really just really believed in the pages of that magazine. It had a different look. It had a different feel. It was the creative direction was was something that 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 not only the fans related to, but I feel the artists respected more than they did Hit Parade or, or Circus. It was a real simple formula, Mark. If you took the high road and you created a hard rock publication with the same integ journalistic integrity as Rolling Stone or Kerrang! or Metal Hammer, and you weren't fake news long before fake news. Right. If you're telling these, these fans the best, coolest inside stuff about their heroes, yeah. and you're running pictures that are double page instead of an inch high, yeah. and you're creating photo shoots especially for the bands, they they just all of a sudden start thinking, wait a minute, and then they see this, and another band sees this and says, okay, so we want our band to be in the magazine. It's like when Sebastian Bach called me when Slave to the Grind came out. He goes, Lon, we've made a heavy record. I don't want a pinup shot on the cover because we put, we put Skid Row on their first cover. I want to be shot by Robert John... Which, is, which was Guns N' Roses, right. and Sebastian idolized Axel. We want to be shot by Robert John and me holding a broken bottle with a wide-angle lens. Wow. Because that's what you want, and then that's what you'll get. Yeah. So you develop a trust with the lead singer. It, it, it gravitates throughout. Right. And then other artists see what you're doing, and it was just that. We didn't promote it. You know, we threw parties that were pretty legendary, and they all played for free. All yeah. those bands, but we just did a good, we did something good for fans and for the and for the and for the musicians themselves, and that was real simple. We didn't lie. Yeah. And unlike unlike Circus Magazine, Rip never put boy bands on the cover. Yeah. Which Circus <laughs> did eventually. I mean, they yeah. really sort of I, digressed. Don't sit. I, I won't sit in judgment of the other magazines because they 
they had an audience and believe me circus and hit parader came before us and have they had much more newsstand sales than we did i just didn't think about competing i just thought about being better and taking a higher path and being looking better and sounding better right on and that's what well let's let's go back to the pages of rip oh. any memories of this one okay let's, i gotta put my glasses on See, oh, this shit. is well, rip yeah, what is the date on this this okay. is rip may 1991 Okay, that's Richie bon- Simbora. I wrote this John cover bon line, Bon Jovi, Dead or Alive. What inspired this trip was uh, Mercury Records called me and said, the band is hearing all these rumors that they're breaking up, and we want you to do a cover story that really tells the story of how strong the band is. And I said, well, okay, so... What's what's your idea? We want to fly you to Japan to see the group play New Year's Eve at the Tokyo Dome. And you could spend four or five days over there. We'll fly you business class and you can come back. That's how influential Rip was at the time. They were going to invest this marketing share. So I said, okay. Now this, first of all, let me tell you the story about this cover shot. Ross Halfin, he... I said I'd like Ross Halfin to be flown over to be my photographer. So they 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 flew Ross there, and as much as I love Mark Weiss because he was shooting over there too, sure. I wanted something exclusive. So after I collected, you know, well, first of all, the show was amazing, and I'll tell you a funny story. The day after, well, I have two good stories of Tokyo. The night that we went to the Lexington Queen Bar near the Rapungi near the Capital Tokyo Hotel in Rapungi. And um, Sebastian and Billy Joel got into a drinking contest. Wow. <laughs> and nice. Billy just leveled Sebastian. Yeah, I it, can was, imagine. it was so cool. <laughs> yeah. I, and, I, and Skid Row played this show, and so did Cinderella. And did Tom they? Kiefer. Okay. You could yeah, ask Tom. Tom. He's here this Tom, evening. Tom here, and, here at M3. Here, yeah. And um, the, the t- night after, or two nights later, uh, Richie says, hey, we're going to see Billy Joel. I go, we are? He goes, yeah. He's putting two chairs right on the stage, 20 feet from his piano, and we're going to watch. Wow. And I I have always been a Billy Joel fan. I yeah. saw the tur- Turnstiles tour at 76, still one of the greatest concerts of all time. At Santa Monica Civic, they two and a half hours, six encores. But that, that trip was something. And... We played Yokohama after Tokyo, like three days later, and we went to the this end of this dock, and Ross said, this is where I'm going to shoot him. I'm going to shoot him on this, uh, right at the edge of this dock, and I got an idea, and I said, tell me your idea. He goes, well, you know, Richie's he's just always angry. At, he, they just don't like each other, man. I said, I know. So I got it in my head. I'm going to set up the shot, and he set up this shot where – John is like the front man, the master of the universe, yeah. and Richie's kind of looking like, I know I'm in the background. I know I'm always going to be in the background. Wow. And that's, that's a lot this is that, what yeah. Deep. this is what made Rip special, <laughs> yeah. was wow. we thought carefully about how we were presenting the acts. And I, I'm very proud of the piece I wrote uh, because it was honest it was re- and it, and the conclusion it came to was that this band was going to stick together because they they cared about their fans their global base they cared a lot about playing great shows and they're consummate pros these guys they're and that cool. was really a, that that's the nice. story of that one let's do another two quickly here one of the greatest singers of all time white lion by the way mark that was the first time i went to japan was in 89 with white Lion. oh yeah okay. yeah so this was my second trip this 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 magazine represents my two own my only two shows t- to the far east nice <laughs> yeah and that was like great man it. yeah I'm still friends with Greg D'Angelo all these years later. I love cool. Him. How about this one? We have oh, okay. August 1990, Robert Plant, the great singer of Led Zeppelin, wow. and in his well into his now solo years. I have to study this, this one for a minute. Rock Lita started. Ford. Wait, let's see who did. I have to cheat and see who wrote. Well, this was this was the issue. This was when Lita Ford's mom had taken over the. For, 
for Jack Russell. Yeah, Dear yeah. Mama yeah. Ford. Okay. Well, there were there were three bombs. It was was it Nugent's mom? Nugent. Nugent. Ma right. Nuge was yeah. the first. Then there was Mama Ford. Okay. And she passed away, and I went to her funeral in Long Beach. And then there was Jack Russell's Dear Ma Russell. Right. And then I left in '94, so that was it. Okay. So here's here's the plant. Okay, Sylvie Simmons. So here's what else made Rip great was I hired the best of the English journalists, of the British right. writers. And Sylvie, Mick Wall, Malcolm Dome, these were the, the writers overseas. Robin Dorian, these were the, 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 the best freelancers yeah. who they had relationships with the artists. I never had a personal relationship with Robert Plant. I developed a very interesting, humorous one with Jimmy Page, which we're not going to talk about now. Right. But Sylvie, she had, she had a connection. So I always figured that the best content comes when there's a uh, there's a camaraderie or a chemistry already established between the writer and the artist. And we're 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 covering one of the greats of all time. So the plant cover story was assigned out and I remember John Kalodner took me to see Robert in Florida and that was the first time I met him and it was just backstage it was just a quick hello but he was he was really cool years later I saw Robert Plant with uh, play with um, at the Greek theater with a T-Bone Burnett show with um, what's her name uh, Alison, Alison Krauss. Krauss. Yeah, yeah, well, that was. And he's he was just like so humble. He just sat and did background vocals and yeah. he looked and he watched the band play. He was so happy. Right. And I I, I love Robert. Plain. Cool. It's another Ross Alfin cover shot. So that yeah. yeah, that's a Ross Alfin. Now this Aerosmith Skid Row. What really went on during the year's most scandalous tour? <laughs> yeah, that's a Gene Kirkland shot, and. Yeah. yeah, I just like thumbing through. I haven't seen this issue in forever. Oh, here's Adrian Vandenberg, Sherry Folio. There's another one who had a relationship with a lot of bands. Fresh Blood, Thunder. Okay, so Thunder, here's a trivia story. Thunder, another great British band. Clodner signed them. Okay. I was putting the... Uh, so ironic too because just yesterday i'm exchanging texts with susan silver because we were chris and i were going to see alice in chains playing dc it was over an hour driving his flight was an hour late and we were so tired so i'm she says lana the guys are waiting and i got it all set up and right. i said we, we can't make it don't, don't be mad at me and yeah. she said i could never be mad at you i love her the rip party that Susan and I essentially put together. Susan uh, was Allison Chain's manager, Soundgarden's Chris manager. Cornell's wife, ex, first wife. Yeah, first wife. Uh, mother of his first kid. Yes, yeah. Lily. And um, she and Kelly Curtis, they, they built that empire with those bands. In, uh, and it was Soundgarden were the godfathers, and then Alice and James came and were the first one to get radio play. And then Pearl Jam, we, are, we all know that story after yeah. Mother Love Bone. Um, we put this rip party together, and it started with uh, Soundgarden uh, was going to play. Right. And um, and then Susan called me, and she said something to the effect of, would you like Pearl Jam, too? I said, they can play earlier in the bill. I said, yes. And then she calls me. The second phone call is, you know, they've never done a Temple of the Dog jam. How would you like that? And I said, Yes. So then it just started building and uh, Spinal Tap was added. Right. And Joe Sat Bob Pfeiffer from Epic Records got Joe Satriani to, to jam with Spinal Tap. MTV shot that, I believe they were yep. there covering it. Yeah. Then Alice in Chains comes in. I think, it, I don't know what, what order, but Alice in Chains comes in and Duff McKagan is going to get on stage with Alice in Chains. So it became nuts. But right. the first two bands on the bill. The first band that opened the show, I think, was Thunder. Thunder, okay. Was Thunder and maybe the Screaming Jets from Australia. Oh, Those right. two. And then the rest was all Seattle and Spinal right, Tap. Right, right. And that Temple of the Dog Jam remained the only one of its kind for decades. In fact, 
Cameron Crowe in his film Pearl Jam 20, the documentary great, of Pearl Jam. Great documentary, Jam, yeah. Has footage of Eddie and Chris on stage, and it says, it's their, it's their label on the screen, October 5th, 1991, Rip Anniversary Party. Right. And I, I, to be perfectly honest, I didn't even know there was a camera in the room. Yeah. But I guess there were always cameras. Right. And that was... Yeah, that's what this just evoked because of, and right, I sure. loved Thunder. Thunder and yeah, Thunder. what a great band! Oh, another gr- Mark Putterford, another terrific foreign journalist. No, oh, yeah, wrote this Dio piece. So see, what an eclectic mix of. He really was a great yeah. magazine. I mean, I'm like from you White know, this Lion really to was, Jane's Addiction, and we to, were yeah. eclectic. Totally, man. We had the we had the icons, and we had the new one. Look, there's Lita Ford. Oh, I wrote this piece. The Days and Nights of Lita Ford. Right. Um, she thanked me last year at the NAMM show when, when the She Rock yeah, Awards remember that, yeah. for, for being the first uh, editor to put a woman on the cover. Yeah, I saw, I saw that footage. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that was we, really yeah. sweet of her. And I go back to the Chic magazine days, even pre rip with her, because I interviewed her for Chic. I interviewed her and Ricky Rackman for Chic's music notes section, the close up section of Chic magazine, prior to my taking over rip. Yeah, and this night, uh, uh, those two one, one delinquents. One. We're, we're going back now. now you're to making me feel all nostalgic, like yeah. everybody <laughs> out there in this crowd tonight. <laughs> February 1991, a band that will play tomorrow night with neither of these guys. Neither of them. (laughs) On stage with with them. Queens right on the cover. So this was my idea. You know, Ross would have so many great photos. And he was, he and Niels Lozar, Gene Kirkland, Robert John, Mark Lee Aloha, they, 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 they were so much about the, 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 the visual stunning page turning quality of the magazine was because of these guys so he sent I, i'm going i'm editing all these photos like we need a cover line for we we need a good cover and he sends this picture with this white background and i go to my art director oh this is cool i'll just well let's do a couple thought balloons over the heads because they're a thinking man's right band, yeah you yeah. know and cool logo huh jeff don't bother me, Chris. I'm thinking this <laughs> was a, out of the ordinary. Kind yeah. of. We did a couple. We we did a rat cover where Piercy is has got the band. He's holding on to a photo of the rest of the band because I frankly couldn't get a decent shot of the whole band. Wow. So I had a great shot of Steven and then the rest of the band holding up. Then we had a, then we had a great white cover where Jack Russell has an angel on one hand and a devil on the other, and it's all about his crazy, you know, sexual curiosity and mm. brain this was also during the making of metallica series the covering of the black record that only one magazine had access every month to the studio where black was being recorded the one-on-one studios in north hollywood and that was this magazine and that was the part two, two as oh, early in this process and um look at the ba- okay let's just like iron maiden still strong out there little caesar I don't think they're around anymore. Maybe I don't know. Electric Boys. I don't know. Annihilator. I don't know. River Dogs. I don't know. Scorpions. Yeah. yeah. River Dogs is uh, Vivian Riv- Campbell who will be here. Oh, okay. Tomorrow, so they're actually. still around. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Winger. Yeah. Kip's yeah. getting Winger's Grammys year, for yeah. his orchestral works now. And of course, there's our friend Tom Kiefer again. Yeah. He's ubiquitous. What's the constant in this? Tom Kiefer. Let's go downstairs and see Tom. Oh, and Glenn LaFerman was one of our best photographers, too. And he, this is Glenn's backdrop. You can always tell the gel, the pink, blue, or green gels or gray gels. Judy Weeder, freelancer, who wrote this, went on to form, she edited a, uh, a very influential gay publication called The Advocate. I remember and, that, yeah. And sh- she's an award-winning journalist, but wrote, wrote for us. That was, a, oh, look at this, Little Caesar. Lots of tattoos. Catherine Bitch Thurman, photos by Robert Hogg John. We had fun. We had fun, right? Oh, look at, there's Warren. Look at them. <laughs> They'll be here and tomorrow the, at 11 tomorrow. o'clock. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I flew in with them. Yeah. And the late Janie Lane. Yeah. Good, good guy, troubled, troubled man. Well... We're so, going to have to wrap it there, actually, because I think we have some other interviews taking place. But um, Really? They're lined up for you? I'm kind of enjoying read, going through the old publications. Look at Kip. Kip, yeah. 
Yeah. Wait a minute. Isn't one of his guys here tonight? Yes. Yeah. Paul Taylor's here. Who's uh, Who's Paul playing with? Just hanging He's, out. He, he just came to hang. To hang. To hang. To, to like be around. Like this. Why do we come? Right. No, no, no one's paying us to be here. We're not. We don't have a gig. Right. We come because the energy and the fans, and they remind you of a time. I mean, it's nice that people recognize you. That's cool. But that they, to evoke a magazine, a magazine that's been gone for decades. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe that's the theme here is that it still resonates with fans, and that's yeah. what's important. We did. So, I did something good. We did something. Absolutely. Good. And you got Chris on board now, who. Is keeping the, keeping keeping it alive. He carries the smoldering, flaming torch <laughs> of Rip Magazine. He's doing a great job. Probably. He's building great social media. And I told him, don't even think about doing a magazine. Just let people embrace what that logo meant and what the spirit of it was. And they'll 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 get those shirts. Everybody he shows a shirt to. I want the shirt. Yeah. Tammy holds the shirt up today. Tom Kiefer. I'll I'll put on the shirt. So, yeah, it's like back in the day, I used to give those shirts out, and the artists would wear them, and that's what builds your, it's what builds your brand. Sure. And it's cool. There's more in store for Rip. Good. Chris says there's more, more in store yeah, for no, Rip. They're, yeah. they're, they're, Absolutely we, more We have a, a d- ideas for some things. Cool. Beyond the, uh, just uh, going online and competing with those hardworking news sites is lending the name the essence of what the name meant, the history of the name, to maybe events. Cool. Absolutely. Things so like stay that. tuned. Yeah, stay we tuned will stay tuned. And, and stay metal. And stay metal. Chris and, Bush, lawn friend, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mark, for And your Mitch LaFon working the camera. Th- Mitch, you did an excellent job. <laughs> <laughs> you could go to work for VH1, your handheld man. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to our Talking Metal YouTube page. See you next time.